One of the most common questions that you'll get from medical students and interns is, can you give a guide on fluids? And so in this video, I want to give you a brief approach to how I teach fluids when I'm on rotation. So the first thing that I do is really I just have them start listing out all the fluids that they know, and we just start writing them down from top to bottom. So the first one is going to be normal saline, and then they're going to probably say, oh, lactated ringers. Some people at this point might even say something like plasma light. Then there's D5 water, D10 water, and then there's 3% hypertonic saline. And then you also have things like half normal saline or D5 half normal saline or D5 lactated ringers or D5 half LR. The main way to categorize these from here is that these three on the left, normal saline, lactated ringers, and plasmolite, are all going to be kind of your fluid resuscitation uh, fluids, whereas D5 water and D10 water are going to be things you use for hypoglycemia or hypernatremia. 3% hypertonic saline is going to be for hyponatremia. And then these ones over here are going to be kind of your maintenance fluids. So starting with the normal saline, lactated ringers, and plasmolite, there's one really good table that I like to just Google uh, every time and just uh, post for them when we're going over these fluids. And that's going to be this table right here. And it can really tell you some of the differences between these uh, different uh, fluids. So normal saline, you can see, is going to have a high sodium content of 154. LR is lower at 130. And then plasmolite is 140. Another thing that's important to look at is the pH levels of each of these fluids. So normal saline is going to be the most acidic whereas plasmolite is going to be the most physiologic or close to what a normal blood pH would be. And then in terms of cost, you've got normal saline and LR being roughly the same in terms of cost, whereas plasmolite is going to be about five times more expensive, at least per this table. So going back to uh, the discussion of normal saline and LR and how to pick these, I would say that normal saline was kind of the classic fluid resuscitation uh, fluid in the past, uh, but I would say it's kind of an old default that we would use in the past. Uh, it is good for hyponatremia because it has that highest amount of sodium. So that's why I'd like to reach for this in, in these cases. However, uh, the main side effect and one of the reasons that we don't use it as much as we used to is because it can cause a metabolic acidosis. Specifically, when people ask you about this, it's called a hyperchloremic non-gap metabolic acidosis. Moving on to lactated ringers, I would say that uh, you basically can never go wrong with choosing lactated ringers. This, at this point, should probably be your default as it is mine, and you can basically order it in any different uh, scenario. A couple of things that people sometimes get concerned about with lactated ringers is the potassium level, and so they argue that if a patient has hyperkalemia, then you should not give them lactated ringers because it could theoretically uh, increase their potassium levels. But this is actually not the case, and this doesn't actually play out in real life. So when you give them lactated ringers, and you give them a liter of lactated ringers, the potassium level of that is four milliequivalents. And so all that it can do is drive the potassium level down to about four milliequivalents. So for example, if somebody's potassium was 5.5, it would actually go and correct in the, the right direction, which is down to four. Not only that, but actually normal saline is more likely to induce uh, hyperkalemia than lactated ringers is. The reason for this is that if I draw a cell right here and then I draw um, a blood vessel right here. So normally you have a bunch of potassium ions kind of hanging out in your cell. And then if you give normal saline, remember normal saline has a lower pH and also has that risk of the hyperchloremic non-gap metabolic acidosis. So now you're increasing the H plus ions out in the bloodstream or in the serum. And so what happens, obviously, uh, these are going to try and equalize with each other. And so what you get is this exchange of the hydrogen ions for the potassium ions. And so what happens is you end up getting more potassium in your blood, in your serum, uh, when you give a more acidic fluid like normal saline. All of this is to say that lactated ringers, despite having some potassium in it, is less likely to cause a hyperkalemia than a normal saline is. So going back to LR, it's almost always a good choice. Does not worsen hyperkalemia. And finally, there were several trials that found that balanced crystalloids like 
LR, and plasmalite actually had improved outcomes compared to normal saline. So these are the SALT ED trial, and which was done in non-ICU patients, and then the SMART med and surge trials, which were done in ICU level patients. The SALT ED trial showed that there was decreased risk of renal events or renal injury in patients who received LR plasmalite. And SMART med and surge trials showed that there was decreased risk of death, decreased need for dialysis, and decreased kidney events and other things such as that as well. Moving on to plasmalite, I think one of the things that is great about plasmalite is if you take a look at it, this really seems to be the most physiologic appearing um, solution given its sodium levels and potassium. It's got some, uh, it's got a normal pH, things like that. It's even got some magnesium in there. So uh, in my experience, this is often used in the ICU. Uh, a lot of palm crit doctors like to use this medication. And the main reason is because its pH is high uh, at 7.4 compared to the other two uh, solutions. And so many patients are acidemic all the time and worsening acidemia obviously worsens their response to pressors and can also lead to worsening organ dysfunction. So besides being uh, the most physiologic, uh, it also has a higher pH, which can be beneficial. That being said, uh, there's no evidence that it improves outcomes uh, over lactated ringers, and it is more expensive. So definitely something nice to reach for when you're treating very, very ill, very sick ICU patients. But know that even if you go for LR in these scenarios, you're not uh, doing something wrong. Uh, you're still definitely giving them standard of care. All right, so moving on to D5 water. This is obviously going to be used if patients are hypoglycemic because that D5 is just providing them extra sugar or if they are hypernatremic. So if their sodium level is high, then we can use the D5 water to dilute that down and just give them free water, basically. One of the questions you may uh, wonder is why can't we just give them pure water uh, for hypernatremia? Like, why can't I just infuse water into them? And the reason for that is if you have a cell right here and you have the bloodstream coming in again, and uh, you give and say that the tonicity of the cell is 290 and all of a sudden, sudden you give uh, free water, which is, has a tonicity of zero, uh, then what's going to happen is osmosis is going to occur and you're actually going to have a bunch of fluid go into that cell and it's just going to expand and expand until the, ex the uh, cell just pops open and bursts open. So this is the reason we can't just give free water without any glucose in there. So we have to give D5 water in order to balance the tonicity a little bit and so that the cells don't uh, swell up and explode. D10 water, uh, I really reach for if they have really bad hypoglycemia or if they are fluid overloaded and for some reason we need to limit uh, the amount of fluids we're giving. So for example, if somebody is receiving 50 cc's an hour of D5 water, then if you give them D10 water, then you can give them 25 cc's an hour, and that'll help prevent uh, excess fluid from building up in their body. Next, we have 3% hypertonic saline. This is going to be if somebody has symptomatic hyponatremia. And when we're talking about symptomatic hyponatremia, we're not just talking about a little bit of a headache, uh, feeling a little nauseous or anything. This is like confused and altered, uh, seizures, comatose, things like that. That's when you give a 100 milliliter bolus and you should expect to see an improvement of about three to four milliequivalents. And then you can decide whether you need to keep giving them more uh, hypertonic saline or not. And just as a review for hyponatremia in general, uh, for hypertonic saline, you're going to keep giving it to them until their symptoms uh, improve. Uh, that's for sure. But overall, uh, goal correction rate for sodium is going to be less than six to eight milliequivalents over 24 hours if you do not know how long they've been hyponatremic for. So if you know that the onset was less than 48 hours ago, you can actually correct them as quickly as, as possible. But if there's unknown chronicity or it's greater than 48 hours, then you need to go very slowly in order to reduce the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. And finally, let's get to this hodgepodge of fluids over here. Half normal saline, D5 half normal saline, D5 LR, D5 half LR. I think this is the big part that gets people confused because they're like, man, how do people know how to choose these different fluids? And how do they know how much to give? Like, basically, it's, it's confusing, right? So uh, the big thing to know here is that all of these are going to be used basically for maintenance. And it's pretty much like spur of the whim on which one the per, you know, people choose. Uh, I think the most common one that you'll see is like D5 half normal saline uh, because it gives a little bit of sugar. Maybe it gives them some calories when the patients are NPO. But really, you can go for any of these and they're all pretty much equivalent to each other. Now, in terms of maintenance, uh, the surgeons, uh, I like to use 
uh, what's called the 421 rule to determine how much fluids to give somebody while they're NPO. And uh, this basically states that for the ten, first 10 kilograms of the patient's weight, you should give them 40 cc's an hour of uh, maintenance fluids. And then for the next 10 kilograms, you give them 20 cc's an hour. And then for any 10 kilograms after that, you then give 10 cc's an hour of fluids. So for example, if you had a patient who was 90 kilograms, the first 10 uh, kilograms will account for 40 cc's an hour. And then the next 10 kilograms will be 20. And then they have seven times 10 more kilograms after that. Uh, so that'll be 70. So this will give them a maintenance fluid rate of 130 cc's an hour. So that's one way to calculate or estimate how much fluid a patient should be getting for maintenance. Um, I did forget to mention that while all of these kind of slightly hypotonic solutions are uh, indicated for maintenance fluids, you could also just give them plain normal saline or LR or plasmolite. You can give them isotonic fluids as well, and that would also help with the patient's maintenance fluid requirement. The one thing that I'll say is that uh, from a medical patient perspective, sometimes the 421 rule uh, can lead to volume overload. That's because in the surgical patients, they're typically younger, they're typically healthier, they can tolerate higher levels of fluids than a lot of the more elderly, frail, and just kind of very ill population that we see in medical patients. So I tend to be a little bit more conservative than this 421 rule. For me personally, if the patient is elderly or frail, a lot of times I like to start with something like 50 to 75 cc's an hour. If they are a kind of average weight and I think they can tolerate it, then a lot of times I'll do 75 to 125 cc's an hour. And then uh, there are some special conditions where you really, really want to flood them with fluids. And so that would be things like pancreatitis, rhabdomyolysis, tumor lysis syndrome, hypercalcemia. These would tend to be things like 200 to 250 cc's per hour. So I hope that gives you a good kind of guideline for how to choose the rate of maintenance fluids for your patient. A couple other key notes for giving maintenance fluids is that uh, you should always set an end time. So sometimes uh, patients are started on maintenance fluids, 125 cc's an hour, and there's no end time. And they end up having fluids running for five days. And then you look at their ins and outs and they're plus 20 liters during their hospitalization and they're completely fluid overloaded, edematous. You've sent them into heart failure or something like that. So make sure you set an end time. So I frequently set 10 hour end time, 12 hour end time, sometimes 24 hours. But when you order that initial fluid maintenance, put an end time to it. And then lastly, I would say consider boluses over doing maintenance fluids um, because there's several advantages to boluses. For example, one of the things that we frequently bolus patients for is if they're hypotensive. So if you give them a 500 cc uh, bolus of fluids, you can assess if they have fluid responsiveness uh, and their blood pressure improves after you provide them with some fluid. The other thing is that it reduces the time that a patient is tethered to an IV, which can actually end up being a pretty big deal. So instead of giving somebody 100 cc's an hour for 10 hours, which will cause them to be stuck to the IV pole for 10 hours. You could just give them a one liter bolus now and get, get it all over with. And you're not going to have that problem of people not forgetting to turn off fluids after a while either. This is really helpful because whenever you tether a patient to an IV, you're going to be limiting the patient's mobility and increasing the risk for deconditioning. And additionally, in, in a lot of the elderly patients, uh, having IVs in and maintenance fluids running these are all risk factors for uh, hospital-acquired delirium. So the less that we can have people attached and hooked up to a bunch of lines and stuff in the hospital, the better. So again, boluses will have better mobility, less delirium. And generally what I do here is I'll give 500 cc uh, bolus uh, for elderly or frail patients who I'm not sure if they're going to tolerate it very well. And then I'll reassess in 30 minutes to an hour to see how they responded to it and decide whether we want to give more or not. Or if they're a younger patient or you think they can tolerate more, they're more volume down, you can give a one liter bolus and then reassess in 30 to 60 minutes as well. Again, a very important to do that reassessing part 
So you see how they responded to the the fluid rather than just letting them sit there and be all dry or you know you overloading them on accident by giving them too many fluids. I really hope this video helped and now you have all the keys at your disposal to know which fluid to, to select at what time. Basically, you're never wrong to go with LR, but there are some slight differences where you might want to choose different fluids. So definitely review this to, to know which ones those are. But hopefully this was helpful. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.